Sometimes I lay on top of the moon. I thank God that I'm breathing. Then I pray, don't take me soon. Cause I am here for a reason. Sometimes in my tears I drown. But I never let it get me down. So when negativity surrounds, I know someday it'll all turn around. Because all my life I've been waiting for, I've been praying for. For the people to say that we don't want to fight no more, there'll be no more wars, and our children will play one day. all lose, cause we all lose when they feed on the souls of the innocent, blood trends pavement, keep on moving, though the water stay raging, and be still, you lose your way, you way, might drive you crazy, but don't let it face you, no way, no way, sometimes in my tears I drown, but I never let it get me down. So when negativity surrounds, I know someday it'll all turn around. All my life I've been waiting for, I've been praying for, for the people to say that we don't want to fight no more. There'll be no more wars that our children will play one day, one day, one day, one day. One day. It's one day, one day. I would change, treat people the same. Stop with the violence, down with the hate. One day will I be free and proud to be under the same sun, singing songs of freedom like you. Say that we don't want to fight no more. There'll be no more wars, and our children will play one day, 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 one day. Good morning, everybody. We wouldn't be 11 11 if it wasn't a reminder what life was like. So it's great to see everyone here this morning, and uh, we're in our fourth Sunday of Lent, I believe. Um, and our theme is this morning, our theme is thinking about how we create space for hope in the midst of despair. And it hasn't been an easy one for me to think about, actually, and a little bit challenging, I think, for all of us in reality. But, uh, but, but it's a good time to be thinking about these things it's this season of Lent, but it's also just a good thing to think about from moment to moment how we can participate in life in a way that makes a difference. Oh, there's sound, yes, okay, even, even better. Now can you make my sermon sound good? <laughs> can, you just, can you just filter it so it interprets what I said? Okay, all right. So let's stand together as we open with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Holy One, we are grateful always for this chance to be in community, always to be here with one another, to be reminded of what it means to be a part of creation and a part of all of the goodness, as well as the challenges and obstacles that are around us. Bless us in our time together this morning as we seek to be witnesses to what is good in life and to what is hopeful in life. Amen. 
So let's start together with this song, uh, this great song. This is a familiar one that we do a lot in here. It's a great wake up song. The words are in your uh, bulletins. They're also on the back wall if you just want to check that out, you know? <laughs> Let's sing it together. Here we go. We'll wake up. I did. At the dawn of steel. Wake up. Cast up all your fears. Or whatever haunts your dream. How we'll live beside. Dreams. We don't do it there, wake up, oh, it out. wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. There you go. The dawn is here. No, no pressure, no guilt. The wake past up. is a memory. The next thing is a mystery. From different roads we came. Yet somehow it's all the same. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. The dawn is here. Another verse, here we go. This life is a story book. Right now, if we only look. You'll see the pages turning. We feel our spirits burning. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. The dawn is here, Jim. Another verse, here we go. Wake up, for now is your time. Wake up, joy is ours to find. And beauty waits to be discovered. As every day stone is uncovered. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Dawn is here. Let's sing some more. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. At the dawn is here. Yeah. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. The dawn is here. Way to go, team! Take a moment and offer one another signs of peace, if you would. So um, 
We're still, we're, our technology is uh, still giving us a hard time on the front screen here, so I think we're going to have the back screen working here in just a second, and we'll show. I have a video clip that I want to show from a, from a movie that uh, many of you probably saw. Uh, it came out in the mid-90s. It was called Life is Beautiful, um, one um, amazing sort of tragic comedy uh, story about um, uh, a man and his son, Actually, his wife, all three of them caught up in the Nazi o occupation, and then they were split up, the, his wife, and then the man and son went to an uh, internment camp. And uh, Bertolini, I forget Bertolini's first name, um, but he was the one who won an Oscar for that, if you remember, and he did the whole leaping thing, and he was, uh, he was every bit the character he played. Um, but the scene I want to show you is this wonderful scene, and if it's going to come up in the back, oh, are we going to try to get it on the front screen? Okay, keep talking. <laughs> All right. I'll just do my sermon here. The scene that we were going to, that I want to show you is this great scene where, um, where the Bertolini's character is with his son and they are in one of the barracks. They're all crowded in the barrack and it's their first exposure to uh, the, the Nazi soldiers who are going to come in and give them instructions. And the, and the one guy says, uh, does anyone speak German? He's saying this in German, of course. And, and of course, uh, Bertolini's character looks around and, and doesn't see anyone who can speak German, which is a perfect uh, opportunity for him then to step into that moment. And we're going to talk about perfect opportunities. But he steps into that moment and then says, I speak German. And because his young son is there, he reinterprets everything the German uh, soldier is saying and makes it look like they're about to engage on this long game. It's going to be this amazing game, the prize of which is a camel. <laughs> you will win two camels. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure where. Oh, there we are. Okay. We are. Now we're ready for this. All right. Chi si attirisca? No. Alles Herren, ich sage das nur einmal. Comincia il gioco. Chi c'è c'è? Chi non c'è non c'è. Ihr seid nur aus einem einzigen Grund in dieses Lager transportiert worden. Si vince an mille punti. Il primo classificato vince un carro armato, vero? Arbeit. Wer so lui? Jeder Versuch der Sabotage wird mit dem sofortigen Tode bestraft. Die Hinrichtungen finden auf dem Hof durch Schüsse in den Rücken statt. Ogni giorno vi daremo la classifica generale da quella sto parlante là. All'ultimo classificato verrà attaccato con un cartello con su scritto Asino, qui, sulla schiena. Ihr habt die Ehre für unser großes deutsches Vaterland arbeiten zu dürfen und am Bau des Großdeutschen Reiches teilzunehmen. Noi facciamo la parte di quelli cattivi, cattivi che urlano. Chi ha paura perde punti. Drei Grundregeln sollten ihr nie vergessen. Erstens. Versuche nicht zu fliehen. Zweitens, folge jedem Befehl ohne Fragen. Drittens, jeder Versuch eines Aufstandes wird mit dem Tod durch Erregen bestraft. Ist das klar? In drei Casi si perdono tutti i punti. Li perdono. Uno, quelli che si mettono a piangere. Due, quelli che vogliono vedere la mamma. Tre, quelli che hanno fame e vogliono la merendina. Scordatevela! Ihr solltet glücklich sein, hier arbeiten zu dürfen. Es wird niemand etwas geschehen, der die Vorschriften befolgt. È molto facile perdere punti per la fame. Io stesso ieri ho perso 40 punti perché volevo a tutti i costi un panino con la marmellata. Gehorsam kann es alles. Dal bigocchi. Noch etwas. Lui di fragole. Bei diesem Pfiff. Alles raus auf den Hof, aber schnell. Ah, non chiedete il lecca lecca perché non ve li danno. Ce li mangiamo tutti noi. Ein Pfiff mit zwei Eiern. Io ieri ho mangiato i venti. Schwein! Un mal di pancia. Jeden Morgen. Per ora un boni. Ist ein Pell. Ah, ciò fare. So, das wollte ich euch noch sagen. Dort hinten werdet ihr arbeiten. Ihr werdet die Dimensionen des Lagers leicht begreifen. Scusate se vado di fretta, ma oggi sto giocando a nascondino. Ora vado, se non mi fanno tana.
Well, we come to a, a time of prayer, and I want to do this song with us. We've done this one before, but since the front screen isn't working, I'll have to use the bulletin here for the words, and you can use the bulletin as well. And I'll borrow Elizabeth's guitar. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's how I keep people from borrowing my guitar. Uh-huh. I know. <laughs> Austin, I'm going to plug in if, it, if that's okay. Yeah, I, I notice there's no adjustment on this strap either. <laughs> it was made just for me. I'm sorry. Uh. So let's sing together this song.
only breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love the way you do, and do what you would do. I'm working without my contacts here. <laughs> Breathe on me, breath of God, until my heart is pure, until my will is one with yours, to be and to endure. passion, joy, and find hope in one and all. Let's sing that a little bit louder so you can help me out. Breathe on me, breath of God, so I may know your call. So A friend sent this poem to me, and I thought I would read this for us to just, a, a chance for us to sort of relax into this time of prayer. It didn't have a title, but as I read this, I, I sort of think of, of um, fair, fairgrounds, like the fair. I just invite you to close your eyes, and I'll read it, and then we'll just have a time of silence. Just take a deep breath. Just relax into this poem, this prose. The mind becomes a field of snow, but then the snow melts. Dandelions blink on and you can walk through them. Your trousers, your feet, plastered with dew. They're all waiting for you, but first, Here's a booth where you can win a peacock feather for bursting a balloon. There's a man in huge stripes shouting about, about a boy who is half swan. The biggest pig in the world is there. Then you will pass tractors pulling other tractors, trees snagged with bright wrappers, and then you will come to a river and you will wash your face. Holy One, life invites us to live. It's not always easy. We find ourselves oftentimes caught up in any number of conflicts, small and large, caves that seem shallow and deep, darkness that seems impenetrable, 
and sometimes with a glimmer of light. But we find ourselves many times facing what seems to be obstacles to this fair ground of life, to this possibility of joy every moment. Teach us to see the gate where we can step through. Teach us to see the light that seeps through the cracks in the darkness. Teach us to respond where we feel our gut turn the slightest bit because of someone else's darkness. Teach us to hear the invitation that we might also be that doorway, that window that we could be that opens up for others to see. Teach us to be in the moment. Amen. I've been asked to read uh, Ezekiel chapter four, uh, 37, verses 1 through 14. The Eternal had a hold on me, and I could not escape it. The divine wind of the Eternal One picked me up and set me down in the middle of the valley. But this time, it was full of bones. God led me through the bones. There were piles of bones everywhere in the valley, dry bones left unburied. Mortal one, do you think these bones can live? Eternal Lord, certainly you know the answer better than I do. Actually, I do. Prophesy to these bones. Tell them to listen to what the Eternal Lord says to them. Dry bones, I will breathe breath into you, and you will come alive. So I did what God told me to do. I prophesied to the bones. As I was speaking, I heard a loud noise, a rattling sound, and all the bones began to come together and form complete skeletons, but there was still no breath in them. So the Eternal said, prophesy to the breath, call out, O sweet breath, Come from the four winds and breathe into these who have been killed. Make these corpses come alive. So I prophesied to the breath. As I was speaking, breath invaded the lifeless. The bodies came alive and stood on their feet. I realized I was looking at a great army. Then the Eternal said to me, Mortal one, these bones are the entire community of Israel. They keep saying, our bones are dry now, picked clean by scavengers. All hope is gone. Our nation is lost. He told me to prophesy and tell them what he said. Pay attention, my people. I am going to open your graves and bring you back to life. You did it there? Okay, good. So, um, I don't know if you've ever read Ezekiel. It's a crazy book. I mean, this is the mild stuff, bringing bones back to life. And we often think in terms of this as being an immediate sort of uh, uh, antecedent or foreshadowing of the resurrection, of the physical resurrection. But as you can see, that's not what this is really about. This is really about Israel, about feeling dead, about being in exile after the Babylonian uh, have, have overtaken and now they're in exile. So this is about new life, in, in, in inspired new life in a people as much as it's about anything. But if you read some of the rest of this, you see sort of a John the Baptist kind of character. Ezekiel is a nut. He's, he's, he sees weird stuff. He's a classic case for the state hospital. 
You would, this would be somebody when I used to work in the state hospital in Austin, and I was a caseworker there years ago before it was opened up and, and, um, and shut. Well, actually, it was shut down. But, but for, for years, that, these were the kind of people that were being brought in. And uh, seeing the wheel within the wheel. And, and the, uh, if you go back and you read some of these chapters, you don't want your kids reading them. Because there's stuff in there that would probably be R-rated, if not our uh, NC-17. Particularly if you go in and try to, and then understand exactly what they're saying. Because in Hebrew it means one thing, and in English it translates rather nicely to mean possibly something benign. But it's not exactly, it's not benign at all. This is a tough book. This is a book that is all about the nitty gritty. It's a book about real life, about the ugly, about the dirty, about the troubled, about the confused, about the addictions. This is a real book about the hardships of life. And Ezekiel, as a prophet, is a nut, and he prophesies in the midst of all of this chaos. The prayer, the St. Francis prayer at this, uh, today is this, is this idea of where there is despair, make me an instrument of your hope. Help me to sow hope. So I started thinking about just what despair is. <laughs> we still don't even keep it. Yeah, just let it go. Let it go, Austin. It's okay. It's all right. We'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. So I look up despair, and despair is what you would think it is. It's a pretty, when you look at the root word, this one's pretty cut and dry. Root word is no hope. That's despair. But I think about how we use the, the word despair all the time. We use it casually, and then we can think of some pretty bleak situations. We use it casually. We say, my situation is desperate. This week was kind of a desperate week for me. I was out of town for three days at a workshop, came back. My mother was in the hospital in the emergency room. There was all sorts of problems. There was bleeding. There was all sorts of ups and downs, low blood pressure, emergency surgery. I had another m couple of meetings on Thursday back and forth to the hospital, um, had to get the bulletin together at the last minute while we were, while we were driving back. So Brad and I are working on this thing in, in route, you know, back and forth. Mary Ann's working on it because she has to leave town. A lot of chaos. And then, of course, my wife and I are both doing two separate weddings over the weekend. And it's her birthday. My mom has another surgery, so I have to leave the wedding rehearsal and rush to the hospital for that surgery. And then we do both weddings in, on, on Saturday, and then the ones in the afternoon, ones later in the evening, and then we're gathering with some friends at that wedding in the evening. And then at 10 o'clock, I'm looking down at the text going, what am I going to talk about? <laughs> and I could say that was a desperate moment. It's, it, it's, we, we talk about desperate situations, job deadlines, family situations, but then there's real despair. Then there's real despair. A friend of mine whose child is autistic, severely autistic, she, uh, her husband, she's a teacher. Husband left her uh, t two years after the child's birth. Um, it's bad, bad scenario, bad scenario. There she, and now she's raising this child. She, she, she's dealing with the life's reality. I think of people I know who are dealing with their spouses who are, who are in the midst of, of Alzheimer's. I think of so many stories that I hear about people struggling with, with children who are dealing with other issues. I mean, there's a lot of despair in the world that we sometimes are distanced from, and the closest we get to is maybe we have a friend or maybe even a relative that then we say to ourselves, you know, we just kind of cringe internally, and at the same time that we're, we're feeling sympathy, we have this distance. If we're honest with ourselves, we have this distance sort of reality which says, you know, there but for the grace of God go I, and I, I just hope that doesn't happen to us. Which is somewhat of a mask, isn't it? It's somewhat of a denial in, in a lot of ways. So then I think of hope. Well, what is hope? Hope in response to despair. Uh, hope, we, can't, we always think of hope as the uh, sort of the, and I don't want to be too cliche about it, but the sort of standard preacher response is God is always with us. God never leaves us. God is by our side. We can always put our hope in God. And then we just kind of keep saying that, right? We just kind of keep reiterating that. And then the resurrection is a symbol of that hope. And so, amen and, and, and good luck. I mean, that's kind of bleak, I realize that, but that's kind of what I grew up with. That's my seminary training. I was trained to be that kind of pastor. But I don't buy that. I don't, that's not the final say. That's the mask. The problem is if we identify too much with the mask, we never get to what's behind that. 
we never get to what we're really called to be. How do we really offer hope in the midst of despair? Now, I don't know if you have mantras. I have a couple of mantras that I use. But one of my favorite mantras or, or mantrists, would that be the word? Mantraists. <laughs> some of you will remember it. Some of you are not old enough to, but most of you will remember this. Some of, how, who remembers Stuart Smiley? Do you remember Stuart Smiley? With his happy, happy, or Jack Handy had the happy thoughts, I guess. But Stuart Smiley, he is famous for the I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? <laughs> How many have actually used that mantra? If you're honest, thank you, yes. I mean, I have, certainly. You know, I've actually walked out of a meeting and gone, okay, that completely sucked, that didn't work at all, but doggone it, people still like me. You know, I've actually used that. Some of my favorite, because I've grown up with alcoholics in my family, and, num and we've been through Al-Anon, and we've been uh, through, some of my other family been, been through Alcoholics Namas, so we got, that's just stinking thinking. That's one of my ones that I often remember. Um, one that I think Charles may have used in here was, you're shooting on everyone. Right? You're shooting on everyone. Okay. Nobody's offended. Okay, good. <laughs> I love this one that he said, trace it, face it, erase it. Trace it, face it, erase it. You're only as sick as your secrets. Well, that's true. Compare and despair. And then my, one of my, you need a checkup from the, from the neck up. Here's a good one. Pee Wee Herman, there but for the grace of God go I. Or my, this is actually my very favorite. It's easier to put on slippers, because this is really where I'm going. It's easier to put on slippers than to carpet the whole world. There's something to think about there. But here's what I'm thinking about when I read this and I think about what hope is. Because if you look up the root words of hope, the root words of hope mean to leap forward. It means to leap forward. It means to hop. It means to take a leap. And that, to me, is probably the hardest thing in the midst of despair. So whenever I find myself in situations where there is despair or where I'm in despair, I try to keep these two phrases in a dance. As you've kind of gotten the sense from what I talk about in here most Sundays, I think of what it means to be in the kingdom of God, to be present in this reality that we call God's kingdom is to be participative, is to participate, is to be active. I've often said in here when we've done the rhythmic things, it's not about me. It's about the community. It's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. It's about connections. It's not about me. Hard to get around that. Because in the midst of despair, the first thing that comes up is my pain. If we're in the midst of despair, it's my pain. And you certainly don't want to go to someone and say, well, you don't deserve to be thinking about your pain right now if they're in the midst of that too. So I try to keep a de delicate balance between this idea of how to respond to this. What can I do for myself? Where can I do that for myself? And where can I do that for others? And that's what I want you to hang on to as I share a couple of thoughts with you. Where can I do that for myself? Where can I do that for others? And it's a constant dance back and forth. I was speaking with a couple of folks that came in, and I said, this is my message, despair. And immediately, scenes came up. Immediately, stories came up. You're thinking of people you know right now. You're thinking of your own life right now. You're thinking of conflicts you've heard of. You're thinking of the global scenario. There's so much different aspects of, of despair, so many different degrees. And our first response is, again, there but for the grace of God go I. But for me, the dance is, what can I do for that? Where can I do something for that problem? Sometimes I'm in the midst of it. Where can I do it for myself means that I'm going to have to look to someone else because it's hard to see the light in the midst of the dark. This scene that we saw from, um, from Life is Beautiful, he does something in this story that is really hard to do but is a profound practice. He reframes the reality. I showed this to my wife, and she said, Linda said, so you're going to basically tell the congregation to just lie. 
Well, I, yeah, I think we do that often anyway. So, you know, I, I, no, I'm not saying lie. I'm saying reframe the reality. I'm saying find the greater truth. He literally reframes the reality for them. The German comes in and is telling everyone that they will be killed. They'll be shot in the back of the head. And he says, you're going to wear jackass on the back of your shoulders if you, if you start to lose points. And if you've watched the movie, I mean, the spoiler alert in the movie, you know, the tank is the prize, right? And, uh, well, I shouldn't spoil it. You need to go watch this movie. It's a great movie if you haven't seen it. It's, it'll tug at your hearts, but it's a profound statement on how to reframe things. This is the month in which we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of Anne Frank's um, life and her death. You all know who Anne Frank is, the teenager who was in captivity, who hid for a number of years until taken prisoner during the uh, Nazi um, 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 rule. Um, but then she uh, was executed sometime in March. I'm not sure exactly when, but 70 years ago. And it occurred to me as I was reading some of her diary, which has such positive affirmations about the world around her in spite of her circumstance, and I was thinking, she wasn't sitting there writing this for anyone in particular. She wasn't thinking, you know what, somebody's going to come and collect this, and they're going to publish this, and this is going to be a great message for the world. She wasn't thinking, I'll put my positive statements on Facebook, and everybody will see it. She wasn't thinking any of that. She was expressing her optimism in spite of the reality around her. Bertolini's character had that belief in hope and that belief in the possibility of, of an optimistic view. He simply reframed reality so that he could try to teach others to see that too. And Frank's character simply believed it and just chose to see it in spite of the reality. Anyone hear the um, American, This American Life yesterday? Did anybody get to listen to that? Powerful, powerful story. If you get a chance, get back online, look it up in the archives, listen to yesterday's report. It was really both moving and deeply, deeply troubling. If you're a teacher, if you've been a teacher, you'll know just how profoundly challenging listening to this story was. This girl who had, was just a brilliant student in a school in the Bronx, in an urban setting, a, a deep in the Bronx, the, the teachers immediately knew that she was a, a, an amazing student, and they were pushing her forward to just make everything work for her. But she grew up in poverty. She grew up with negative narratives. She grew up with these sort of typical narratives that have been ingrained, not just ingrained by the, her own family, ingrained by the cultural around her. And she was fighting that narrative in spite of her abilities. But they had the chance, they chose a few of the students, and they would take these students to the nearby private school. And the private school allowed for one person to be chosen out of a select group to win a full scholarship. And then they would move them on into college. And this was her hope. And she just, she looked around her and she said, this was my destiny. I know I am better than all of this. She could literally see where her narrative was. She could see her whole narrative around her. That was basically working at a grocery store, working at a fast food joint, opening the door for people. She knew that that wasn't her identity. She knew that she was smarter than that. But by the time she got into the process, she was in the last rung of folks being chosen and was eliminated at the very last. And then she disappeared, and the whole story was about where'd she go, what happened to her. And it's fascinating, but the upshot of it was, the sad thing about it was, is that so, 10 years later or something like that, they, they finally run into her, and she hasn't, she's not that far, in fact, from the actual reporter who's doing this report. She finds out she just works around the corner. But it just shut her down. She identified so much with the narrative that she'd grown up with that it completely shut her down. And even in spite of people around her trying to tell her this wasn't her narrative, she still was, was, was prey to her own story, and it shut her down. And even after talking through this process, could not see beyond that, and she worked at a grocery store as a checkout clerk. But then when they talked to some of the other teachers, it was, it was really sad. This was the troubling part. Out of all of the students that do succeed and move to that program, and I forget what they call the program, but when they move to that program into the private school and then into college, only about 5% or so of those students actually graduate. 
eventually they drop out. When that Oklahoma University frat students, the two students were, were expelled for the, the racial statements they were making and everyone was in an uproar about the, how horrible that is. And yes, you know, they should be expelled for that kind of stuff. We don't believe in that. The reality is, is that even though we don't believe in that, we don't take a really hard enough look at the fact that racism is still hugely prominent in our world, in our culture. There are narratives that are so ingrained in our realities that it's going to take a lot more than a few acts of Congress and a lot more than a few funds tossed this way or that way to change the reality of people. All you have to do is to think of your own spiraling cycle of dysfunctional realities that we've all had to deal with at times and how challenging it is to get out of those stupid, negative, spiraling realities that we grew up with. Think if the whole culture was prey to that narrative, how much harder. We have folks around us, at least, that will say, it doesn't have to be your story. We have role models around us, for many of us, that say, this is clearly doesn't have to be your story. To bring hope in the world means that sometimes we have to be willing to reframe the narrative. And sometimes we have to be downright prophetic about it. Sometimes we have to be the ones that are willing to step into the scene and say, you know what, this is not right. There's a different narrative to be heard here. So a couple of things then. The first thing is this. Reframing the narrative is sometimes easy enough to do, and then sometimes for us it's very difficult. Sometimes the role is, where can I do this for others? Sometimes it's, where can I do it for myself? So someone comes up to me and says, I have a real challenge here because I have a friend who's going through this, and I can't see any way around it. And I think, how can you, like Bertolini's character, reframe that narrative a little bit? A friend of mine who's a comic has told me that when his mother-in-law or his mother-in-law, went through Alzheimer's. His wife was so impatient. Well, my sister and my mother have the same kind of relationship, although she's just entering early senility. So my sister, in the middle of this reality, deals with this narrative, which is this constant reality they've had most of their life. But that's not my story. I step into it and reframe that right there, rather than entering into that relationship in that dynamic, I change it up. I improvise. My friend who's the comic says that every time his, his, uh, mother with Alzheimer's, his, step, his uh, mother-in-law with Alzheimer's has, starts to talk to him and she's in some other reality, he simply goes with that reality. While his wife is sitting there saying how challenging this is and how wrong this is and how difficult this is and how broken this is, he simply says, it's not broken, it's just an opportunity to do something else. Maybe reframing begins with our willingness to stop thinking of things as broken, as needing fixing, and just be willing to change the narrative, to reframe it, to participate in a different way. And then the second thing is maybe like Anne Frank, the challenge is for us to simply start believing in the... Uh, Al-Anon group, they have this great phrase called fake it till you make it. Maybe it's, there's a time for us to simply as if. Just live as if and see if we don't start changing the space around us from moment to moment. Amen.
Well, I know we had a, a couple of folks who are wanting to join this morning, and I'm going to invite them just to come on forward if they are here. Yes. Yep. And anyone else? Um, and while that's happening, I want to just make an announcement before we get into our final song together, our blessing song together. Um, Elizabeth is going to be playing where? This weekend? At the Far Best Theater in Mansfield. At the Far Best Theater in Mansfield. The only reason why I bring that up in particular is, well, because she's good, and so it's worth listening Thank to. She's, she's definitely worth listening to. Um, but we don't normally do that. We don't normally say, and by the way, I'll be playing this week at, um, we, tr we don't normally, but, but also several of the band members are going to be joining her, so that'll be fun. And one of our congregational members is going to join too. Um, I believe Penny is going to be playing the fiddle, no, the mandolin. Penny, Mar uh, Penny Armstrong, who is here, is going to play the the uh, mandolin. So that would be worth the, the uh, purchase price, the uh, entrance price as it is. Yeah. So, so it's at the far best theater theater in Mansfield on Saturday. Friday? Saturday. Saturday night. Okay. You still get tickets online. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then be here on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, okay. Come on. And, and I'm sorry. I've done a blank. It's been that kind of day. Yep. Renee and Laura Rosser. Renee and Laura Rosser, who've been visiting with us now for oh, a couple of months or so, I, I think. They're a month or so. And, and just fell in love with our community here. And they are joining um, by profession of faith. And, um, and then, uh, so I have this question to ask of you, these two questions that we ask when people join. And first is if you have belief in God, the creator, our sor the source of our being, the one in whom we move and live and have our being. And if you follow Christ as the path, which we find as our, our place in this world and how we are to live. And then I ask this of all folks who join. We ask in the Methodist Church if you will uphold it with your prayers, presence, gifts, and services. Okay. And they will. And they're really excited about being in this community. We're very excited about having them in this community. They're, they're um, like a lot of folks here. They want to get involved. And so I hope that, um, that we can find ways to, to plug you guys in. But I also want to offer something to you all. Um, in addition to we're looking for, I'm, this is the boring part. I know. It gets slow. <laughs> but um, Dan, I want out. I don't want to not enjoying it anymore. Um, I, I would love to invite you all to respond. Every now and then we get songs suggested. Penny will, will email in a song. Uh, Sharm will email in a song. Somebody will email in a poem. Uh, and you, if you'll look at the prayer, you can see where the next three Sundays are going. I just want you all to know that the invitation is always open for your participation by way of special thoughts or poems or songs that come to mind. Uh, this community is alive when we're all connected in all the different ways. So um, and, and any other area that you think might be fun, that you would like to participate and volunteer in. I don't ever hesitate. This is the kind of community that we are. So we're glad to have both of you all here as a part of that. And we're going to ask you to stay up here while we're singing, and then y'all come up afterwards and say hello to them as well. All right. So let's stand and sing. We'll just stand over here. I am open and I am willing for to be seem so strange it dishonors those who go before us so lift me up to the light of change there is a
So let's everybody take a hand, if we will, here. We just found out also that her father was, um, is at Trinity United Methodist Church, where I was on staff 35, 30 years ago. Yeah, so this is kind of, and, and back then you were like this big. So you could have looked up and said, someday I'll be going to a church where you are. <laughs> It's a, it's a small world, people. It's a small world. Let's pray. Holy One, we are blessed always by the connections we discover. We are blessed by the obstacles that seem to block any pathway. And yet we know, we believe that you are in our midst and that everything is holy. And so empower us. Empower us that we, we can do what we need to do where we are, that we might... If it is us, that we might go ahead and leap, that we might just open that gate, cross over the threshold, jump into the unknown with the belief that your presence is always there and the possibilities are always there. And where we see it in others' lives, may we be that prophetic role that tries to be a window, that tries to be a way to see reality deeply and differently. Bless us as we go from this place. Amen.